Hi, everybody. This is the second podcast for the Overseas Teacher. My name is Carl. I'm going to be the host. And we have another special guest today. This is one of our online teachers, Fraser Murray. <laughs> Hi, Fraser. Hi, mate. How are you doing? I'm very well, thank you. Thank you for joining me. This is our second podcast. The last one went so successfully, we got 30 views. Yes, that's not too so, bad. That's not it's too, not too bad. bad. It's not too bad, but I'm hoping that as time goes on, um, we can get a few more. I'd love to get those three digits. That's a big one for me. I mean, that is definitely, that, that's definitely a big one, isn't it? Yeah, yeah <laughs> it, it is 100%. Um, okay, so we're going to start things off, and I'm just going to simply ask you, Fraser, who is Fraser Murray? Yeah, hi. So I'm Fraser. I'm turning 25 in April and I am an ESL teacher. Uh, I taught in Chongqing uh, for all of 2019. Uh, that's in southwestern China in the Chengdu province. Um, very, very spicy food, very, very vibrant life out there. And it was an amazing experience. Um, I've now moved to online teaching with TOT. And I'm absolutely loving it. So, yeah, I'm currently living back in London now um, just because of complications with uh, obviously the pandemic. And yeah, I'm just working remotely in London right now and enjoying it. That's awesome. So let's let's talk about home life first. So how's how is it living in London at the moment? I, it's a bit of a I mean, I've lived in Brixton before and I know that mm. it's a very vibrant city. Um, but I can imagine that living it, living in London at the moment is just extremely expensive and kind of dull. Yeah, absolutely. It's uh, it's it's a bit of a different uh, vibe going on at the moment. It's a bit of a ghost town, a bit of a Shaun of the Dead esque thing. Apart from yeah. no walking zombies, but uh, <laughs> but yeah, it it's it's definitely it's a bit irritating, as you said, because you know you're, you're spending potentially five pounds on a pint and you can't sit with any of your mates. So uh, yeah, it's uh, it, it's it's complicated i guess but um it's manageable i think you know it, it's it's one of those sort of strange times that we're all going through right now and totally. um we just got to do our best but um yeah i'm only going out to pop to tesco's that's about it these days but um but yeah it's uneventful but you know staying safe so that's that's good yeah i mean hopefully i think there's an announcement tonight by boris hopefully we're going to get some clarity on when we can eventually get out of this lockdown because it is becoming a little bit tedious now to be honest yeah for sure they're, they're saying something about a monday announcement but um i just wonder what, what exactly he's going to say i mean the, the infection rate here is definitely going down but it's uh it's still not where it needs to be um, yeah but yeah and these new variants keep popping up as well right i mean yeah that's the other thing yeah for sure the new variants keep popping up but um you know i i just think that if people can follow China's model of, of these hotel quarantines where that person lands. And I think that's that's the big thing right now is making sure that, you know, the people that are coming into the country are isolating in these hotels for 10 days. And if you don't want to do that, don't come home <laughs> quite yeah. simply. But yeah. uh, that, that's that's my two pence. But I mean, it's it's all politics, isn't it? No, I, I, to I totally agree. The only thing I have of it is should people have to pay I hope to st to stay in a hotel for ten days that they don't actually yeah. they're not actually they don't actually choose to do so it's it's, a, it's being forced upon them I mean I've got some friends I'm at university at the moment and I've got some friends who want to fly back to the UK mm. so obviously they have to leave for the lockdown and apparently you the, they're talking about charging you a thousand pounds for yeah, staying in a, it, in a hotel it's one thousand seven hundred and fifty for ten days which you know it, it isn't you know it's not exactly that you're going to be staying at the Ritz is it but um yeah. you know I I, th I think that if you can afford the international flight I think that this is something that you have to consider and I think that most countries have been doing this for a long time now I think that's yeah. the other that's the other big issue is that we're sort of seeing this as a new thing in the UK. But the reason there are these variants here is that we haven't been doing this from the start. Mm -hmm. um, I remember traveling home from Chongqing when the initial outbreak started. And I went through screening in China, interviews in China. I then laid over in Doha International. Uh, so that's near Dubai. Um, mm -hmm. So I laid over there and had interviews and screening and loads of different health questions. And I had to have all these forms. Um, at the time, we didn't have a COVID test as such. 
Um, but we did have like the heat censoring and sort of symptoms and things like that. But then I went to London Heathrow and I just walked straight through. No You're question. kidding me. No, I'm not. I'm not. And I came from a high risk area in China. I mean, it wasn't Chongqing wasn't a red zone at that point. Um, but, you know, it's it's pretty close uh, to Wuhan. I mean, dude, you um, came from China. You came from China. Like, I came come on, from China. You know I mean? Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, it's a massive place, but you're right. Like, I came from China, and we don't know the origins of the virus, but we do know that it was very prevalent over there, right? And I just walked through. So it, it's a it's a problem, and it's been a problem for a while. I just I just hope that everybody can can get their uh, ideas straight with it and just get something done. Fingers yeah, crossed, me right? too. Me too. Yeah. What was it like being in China at the beginning of the outbreak? What was those initial first couple of days like? I mean, was yeah. it panic? Was well, what was I, going on? I mean, for me, it was. Uh, I was a bit panicked, I must say. But um, doing all of these extra steps and sort of having this news given to you, it wasn't so much that I was nervous because they were incredibly careful with it you know bearing in mind they have dealt with the SARS outbreak in the past they have dealt with highly contagious vi viruses in, in the past in China so this isn't really something that they've never had to deal with before yeah. um, you know kind of like the UK we haven't really had to deal with anything within the last 50 odd years of, of something of that scale so I think that they were definitely very quick to react to anything that, that was happening in terms of, uh, you know, have, having heat screening when you go into the supermarkets, keeping your distance. Um, but yeah, it was a big concern that a lot of fake news was going around in China, that shelves were being emptied. And at the time, you know, we kind of uh, saw in the UK a lot of these impulse buyers with their toilet rolls and things. Mm. Um, but in China, it was it was more of this like fake news going around that there would be absolutely nothing if you needed it, um, which, of course, I found out very quickly that that wasn't the case. Um, but there was just so much misinformation going on despite the censorship. And I think that it was just word of mouth um, and panic kind of on, you know, they have kind of similar to Facebook, Twitter, etc. They've got these apps in China where they can communicate and share news between each other. Um, WeChat. Yeah, WeChat or you've got, you know, things like Dowing and things like that, right? So your WeChat moments, um, potentially you can just get a certain post that can just attract a lot of attention and cause a bit of panic. But um, I think that they dealt with things incredibly well. Um, I lived on the 50th floor in an apartment building, can you believe it? And wow. um, they cut off the elevator to basically dissuade people from leaving the building for unnecessary reasons um so i think that it, it was it was definitely so you had to take the stairs you had to take the stairs I, everywhere i did i had to take the stairs for three oh, weeks 50 floors, 50, up, 50 floors. floors down and um you can't drink the tap water there so if i needed water i had to do oh 100 flights God. of stairs to get myself some water so um yeah, it was all of these little things you don't think about. And, um, you know, they'd had a sign in the elevator for weeks saying we will cut off the elevator at this time. But of course, it was all in Mandarin. So I, I can speak a little Chinese, but um, I definitely I'm, I'm terrible at reading it. And I think most yeah. foreigners go to China are quite bad at reading generally. Um, but yeah, it, it's all of these little things. But I think that I did have a really supportive group of people around me. And I think that that was really integral to to my success of, of not really losing my mind when it first happened and kind of um, also not seeing it as like a zombie apocalypse or something that is scary as well. Um, yeah. just, to, just to sort of play things and just to be safe. And yeah, as I said, I had such great support from foreigners living in China and also Chinese people. A lot of my students were very keen to make sure that I was OK, that I had everything that I needed because, you know, going into a shop and asking a pharmacist for some painkillers that's something that you don't really think about being in the UK as being a problem. But in China, if you struggle to speak Chinese, it can be very, very difficult to to even do basic things. But, you know, you, you are so well looked after when you're over there. You know, you have teaching assistants. Your students can be such great people. I mean, in most cases, I mean, I taught adults, so a lot of my students were mature, so they were able to, you know, do things if if they if they needed to obviously if you're teaching kids they can't really 
help yeah. you out that much but i mean maybe parents could or the staff in the school um yeah you, you have really well uh sort of built networks out in china for for people and just for people to help you so i think that's really important as well yeah definitely i can imagine it can be very rewarding um teaching as well in china but I, I, I do want to ask, what sort of tangible rewards did you walk away with? Is it well paid? Did you get any sort of bonuses, any benefits? Did you have to pay lots of money for your apartment? I mean, what was it What was it like in a tangible sort of aspect? Yeah, sure. So this is the questions that many people ask themselves when they consider whether they'd go to China, right? So for me, I was well paid. I was on a average salary in the UK you know, spending the living costs that my monthly rent, I don't really mind talking about that. My monthly rent in China was 180 pounds, which, oh, wow. which by anyone's standards is incredibly cheap. Um, I had, you know, Western toilet, a very big shower, living space. I mean, it was just me living there. So it wasn't the biggest space in the world. And you can spend a lot more for kind of a bigger place with, you know, better uh, utilities or you know, multiple living rooms, bedrooms, things like this. Um, but yeah, it was perfect for me. And I think that the amount of money you're making versus the your outgoing, so, so what you're spending on groceries or what you're spending on vacation time, you know, things like this, it, it just is, you can't compare it to any job in the UK. You just can't. Mm. And I think as well that the most tangible thing that I could take away from my experience in China is the element of professional development. I think that's, oh, the, wow. that's the biggest thing, because for me, I wanted to enter the education industry um, pretty much immediately after leaving school. And I think that the best thing that I ever did was decide to go to China, because if I wanted to do a PGCE, number one, that's incredibly expensive. Number two, time consuming as well. Um, and a lot of the time, sometimes people leave PGCEs and they actually just think to themselves, wow, that's actually not what I thought it was going to be or that's not what I wanted. Um, and I just I wanted to get thrown into the into the field straight away. Um, mm. I think the best thing about a lot of these schools in China as well, the most credible organizations out there, at least they will have training programs for new teachers. So you'll be able to communicate with the new teachers. You'll be able to learn things from each other. You'll be able to learn things from trainers and people that have been doing it for years. And I just think that that was invaluable to me to be able to have that training initially when I started, you know, making mistakes yeah. and, you know, learning from them before I was actually in the classroom, I was able to really just try anything. And that's the kind of playground that I wanted. And I think that's what China is in a way, is this, you know, the development, the sent the speed that, that, that the country runs at is something that you just don't experience in the UK. I feel like the UK is kind of slowing down with its with its kind of development. You know, I'll, I'll leave the country. I've, I've lived um, in the US. I've lived in the UK. I've also lived in China. And I think that the one thing that just really got me excited being in an Eastern country, especially China, is just the speed, the hustle and bustle. Things are happening and things are things are on the up. And I think that that's just such an exciting thing to see as a young man. And I think that you know, potentially if I was 50, it may be a bit different yeah. uh, just because of the noise and there's constant construction. And there's so many things that that you need to think about. But it is just such an exciting place. And you're willing to to go there you you know you have the opportunity to have a new chapter a new start and i think that 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 was the most tangible thing i could take was just the excitement of being able to do something completely new and get yeah. paid get paid whilst i'm being trained as well you know that that's something that yeah it was the best thing it was the that's biggest awesome, reward. man yeah that's awesome i think that you know if you i mean it's a bit boring but if you look at china from an economical standpoint this is a yeah. this is a this is a country that is rapidly taking over the, the globe. I mean, Big you time, know, every, yeah. everything we look at, I look at this war ball and it says, you know, oh, funnily enough, made in China. Yeah. You know, <laughs> this is yeah. everything. China is around us all over the place. And I think it's a really, really uh, fast, like you said, fast paced place. I've, I've been to Guangzhou, Shenzhen and uh, Hong Kong. Great. And um, I've never experienced a lifestyle like that. I mean, don't get me wrong. 
the days go past like that because it's just oh they you wake, do yeah you you wake up and you, and you don't stop and then when you get back you're knackered so you just fall straight asleep and and yeah you know the living situation you're not living in a nice big house it is a tiny little room yeah. um for me for me it was also Hong Kong was very expensive, but I have her mainland China is extremely reasonably priced. Um, yeah. So I, I can imagine that 100% from a professional standpoint, it's a great place to be, especially coming out of university or not knowing really what you want to do with your life sure. and taking a step to something that you taking a step into the unknown. Mm. Um, I want to still talk a little bit more about the reward side. When you when you had time to just out of interest, when you had time um, holiday time, did you manage mm. to go anywhere else other than China? Sure. So I didn't actually travel outside China uh, okay. just be- just because I had a personal reason that I'd really wanted to travel to Xi'an. So this is in the north, and this is where the terracotta warriors are. So this is one of the oh, wow. wonders of the world, and it it was just something that I personally needed to do. Uh, something that my late grandfather wanted to do but never got round to um, because he was fascinated by, you know, Egyptian calligraphy and sort of st- ancient stonework, really. Um, and that's something that I needed to do kind of not just for him, but for me as well, because we, we both had invested interest in, in that type of thing. Um, I think that, to be honest with you, the, the best thing to be doing is making sure that you have the right contract. I think that's the first thing when you're looking at sort of free time and relaxation. How much time do you want? Because when you're signing that contract, as soon as you get this contract and you get the, oh, OK, you've got the job. I think the first thing that many young people will do is just go, oh, my God, need to sign it, need to get it done. But you're not really looking very, very clearly at, at the fine print because you know, if people say a month long paid holiday for Christmas and for summer, great. But for my contract, I just had the Chinese holidays because for me personally, I didn't at that stage in my time being in China, I didn't want more personal time. I wanted more work time. So you need to find That's that balance. Yeah, you need to find that balance. I think that, you know, with that said, you can also make sure that with this free time, what kind of school do you want to go to? So do you want to teach at a university? Do you want to teach at a training center? Would you like to teach at a kindergarten? Because all of these schools will either offer you more contact hours and maybe a little bit less holiday or a university, for example, you'll be teaching maybe on average between 20, 25 hours a week and you will be getting paid holidays. So a lot of people, you know, kind of want to weigh up whether they want to be going to that right school or or whether that contract's right for them. So with that, my contract was very heavy it was very demanding so i was working uh five days a week i was working from eight till nine at night um eight in the morning to nine at night i mean not for one hour that'd be stupid but um yeah yeah (laughs) but um crazy long hours that's the chinese as well right they work hard oh they really do and it it, you know with that being with us sort of saying it's a fast-paced environment it's also a fast-paced mindset you know these these guys like they want results and they want them quickly and i think that they know each and every chinese person working for this company or studying they know they're replaceable and i think that that's such an interesting thing because so many westerners kind of have this idea of i've got this job i'm untouchable no one's going to replace me kind of thing once once you've got there but the chinese know how many of them that there are fighting for that seat in the classroom or fighting for that that place at that desk so they just work non-stop and they work their very best. You know, most teachers, uh, Chinese teachers that I met only have one day off a week. And I think that that to me was mind blowing to be able to hear just how hard these people work, how hungry they are. And, um, you know, it, it does, it rubs off on you. Um, but for me, I, I just wanted to make sure that when I was uh, managing this job, that I was having enough downtime, I was able to relax. And, you know, I knew I wasn't going to get it out of a holiday because the longest holiday I had was uh, what we're celebrating now, Spring Festival, and that's 10 days. Um, So I had the 10 day holiday. I went to Xi'an for four days of that. Um, But yeah, there there are so many things. I mean, I signed for a gym membership and I think that was imperative to to my stress release. So on the weekends, I was hitting the gym. Um, I was then maybe if I was aching, going to get a massage because they have these like movie theater and massage places um, and they do like food and things like that. And it's a great place for you to go with your friends and relax. It's it's a really 
interesting thing that you don't get out here. Um, so there are lots of things. I'm also a keen golfer, so I was hitting up golf ranges across China. Um, I was then approached right. by a, I was then approached by a lady and her son. Um, I, I met the the best golfer in the under nine category in all of China. And all he wanted to do was just to talk to me in English about golf. That's all he wanted. And I, I think the people in China are just so friendly. You know, I never had a problem with anybody. They just wanted to come up to me. They wanted to know about me. They wanted to know where I was from, why I was in China, how long I'd been in China. And um, yeah, it's, it's just lovely. Everybody is so, so friendly. The amount of meals I was invited out to and, and things like that. Nice. It's just, it's fantastic. They're, they're really hospitable. And yeah, just so, so friendly. Well, that leads me to my next question, which you kind of answered, but I'll, I'll, I'll ask anyway. Was there yeah. ever a time where you felt isolated and mm. lonely or, mm. or, or, or did you always feel inclusive and involved in something? Yeah, I think that's that's a really good question that I didn't really finish uh, answering, I guess, is that, yeah, there was definitely a time where I felt very lonely out, out in China. And I think, you know, the whole point of these uh journeys that you take abroad to, to teach or to do anything is the whole point of it is culture shock and i think mm. that that it that is for me as well one of the biggest things i wanted with professional development is the idea that i just i wanted to have everything in my mind tested um and i, I left with two friends uh, to go to chongqing so i was really lucky i was we had the three musketeers and we were going out working for the same company in the same city uh, we didn't all live together, but, you know, and eventually my two friends decided that it wasn't what they wanted to do anymore, which is fine. Um, but, yeah, it did kind of leave me then looking around thinking, oh, wow, I don't really have my buddies here anymore. I need to to figure something out. Mm. And the way I went about that is that there were societies that I was able to join. Um, if anyone's ever heard of Toastmasters International, this is like a, a global group of people that will practice public speaking. Um, in Chongqing, they have, I think it's four clubs for Toastmasters. And I was invited to be a judge, a panelist, to sort of evaluate people's public speaking in, in English. And that for me was a really rewarding experience because I was able to really just hone in on my passions, which is, you know, public speaking, teaching, mentoring, all of these things. And it really just helped me because although my job was incredibly busy and that other layer on top was a lot, it just, it helped me have this, this ambition, this motivation to, to just keep going really. And, you know, I, I couldn't, looking back, I wish I could tell that version of myself now, you know, everything's going to be all right. It will be okay. But I think as well, diamonds are made under pressure. And I think sometimes if you do have those difficult moments that you just have to think, you know, what goes down must come back up again and, and vice versa, you know. So, yeah, there will be difficult times. But I think that's the point in, in many ways is mm. how you overcome those challenges and the lessons you learn from them as well. So talking about overcoming challenges and there being difficult times, what was it like? Uh, in the day-to-day -day lifestyle of facing the language barrier? Because obviously mm. this is something that a lot of people are concerned about. They don't speak any Mandarin. Obviously, everywhere I go in the world or everywhere in the world I've been, sorry, that it seems as if everybody except the English are trying to learn another language. Whereas, you know, in the UK, we're very stubborn. We know English. We do very basic French or German in school. Nobody, re nobody really cares about it, though. Um, <laughs> very rarely or in fact never have I met somebody who's left GCSE French actually knowing how to string anything in French <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm interested to know how it was facing the language barrier and how you overcome that challenge yeah so I think that initially I was kind of held cradled by my uh, teaching assistant so I had uh, my Chinese teaching assistant with me to help me find my the property I was going to rent they would help me with my medical tests that I had to have once arriving in China and um, I was kind of slowly but surely pushed away by this teaching assistant when they could see that I was more competent to deal with things so it is the most convenient place on earth and I'm I'm completely 
uh, avid about that. That it, it is, regardless of whether you can speak Mandarin or not, you have things like WeChat. So you have translation apps that you can use on your phone. I think that that was a really good crutch for me um, until I wanted to learn to actually speak Mandarin. And I think then for me, the phone got in the way because mm. I would always, instead of thinking on my feet, I just went straight to my phone. So I was then teaching myself to not get my phone out, to try and engage with them. And, um, you know, the taxi drivers are so friendly in Chongqing. I remember uh, being in a taxi and me and my friends would have a competition to see how long we could last communicating with, with our driver. Um, so, you know, it, it is just really, they're so hospitable out there. And I think that's that's the biggest thing is, even though they can see that maybe you don't speak a lot of Mandarin, at least just face-to-face -face encounters, if they see that you are trying, I think that they will, they'll be able to, to help you out. And I think learning little phrases like uh, that, um, things like that, so you can reference to things. So that's kind of how I started was building this like base of words that I could use mm. to sort of like steer things. And I think using TPR as we do with online teaching, it kind of like acting things out, I think was really, um, really important and really helpful. That almost informed my teaching as well, because, you know, I almost became the student, which which then helped me kind of sympathize with my with my actual students. You know, wow, yeah. this is really Difficult. this is really nerve wracking. Yeah. And I kind of I kind of feel like an infant again, like I've lost my power of speech. And, you know, at times it did get frustrating. Don't get me wrong. But as I say, it's you've got that you've got the help of the teaching assistant. That's that's the most important part, I think. So in terms of you know, liaising with agents, um, liaising with anybody at kind of outside of, of the school environment. You you did have that help. Um, but then, you yeah, you were slowly sort of released into the wild after a while. And I think that, you know, that did come with its challenges. But but again, through those challenges, it then just really made me want to learn um, about the language. And, you know, the tricky thing as well as a teacher is to to try and always keep it about English. And I think that's mm. a really important part of teaching is that it's always got to be about the English language because if you then try to communicate with your students or you try to communicate with anybody else in Mandarin during your work time, that's not really what you're being paid to do. And it then becomes kind of about your learning and not the students. So mm. in your own time, when you're kind of, you know, at a bar or you, you're talking with some friends, trying to pick up a bit of Mandarin is actually much easier than it sounds, especially with speaking. Um, I think just as well, figuring out what kind of learner you are. So I'm an auditory learner. I know that, like I learn things from saying it 50 times. So if I need to learn a new word in Mandarin, I will drill it and say it again and again and again until I've at least got the pronunciation fairly clear. Um, and, you know, and then I try and apply it. And I think it's just kind of building building your building bricks that way is just one by one and um you know i'm not the greatest speaker of mandarin by any means but i've definitely given it a go and i think that those pressures helped me get there yeah i think that um you know the, there's lots of these apps nowadays like duolingo which can help you learn different languages and stuff which is brilliant but there's nothing really there's nothing really as good as throwing yourself in the deep end and, re and being forced to learn a language in order to survive. Definitely, yeah. I, th I think that you're right, that the apps are definitely useful, but they don't set you up for that real situation because totally. I, I never met a Chinese person in my life in Chongqing who ever gave me any sort of sympathy for being a foreigner. So they wouldn't slow down their speech. They wouldn't sort of break things down like we do in English. And why um, should they, though? Why should they? Exactly. You're in their country. You should have figured it out by now. And, you know, I, I kept going back to certain restaurants and the waiter would ask me what I wanted. And he'd sort of look at me and he'd go, come on, man, you've been you've been going here for like three months now and you're still not saying anything to me. Yeah. Or, or I'd go get my hair cut. And it's it's everywhere you went. It, it wasn't. It wasn't like they were sort of picking at you, but, you know, they're kind of saying, come on, man, like you need to be making more effort than this. And it, it did. It motivated me. I, I wanted to be able to speak to my hairdresser and sort of ask him, you know, Ni hao ma, what, what have you been doing? How are you? And and sort of just just try my best to stay alive with, with the conversation. And yeah, it definitely pushed me to learn more. Yeah. Nice, man. So moving forward now, mm. um, obviously 
from what I assume, the pandemic happened. Oh dear, everyone's got to go. I've got to go home. Let's get back to the UK. You yeah. come back to the UK. It's a bit of a mess over here, and it's got worse. Um, yes. yeah. Take me through how you went from coming back, having no job, to now officially being an, an online teacher, and in, in specific, working with the overseas teacher. Yeah, absolutely. So. Obviously, I was really lucky that with my research and uh, doing my due uh, diligence, I was able to make sure that I had some money set aside. You know, ideally, the money that I was saving in China through the low living costs, that wasn't for coming home and having no job. That wasn't what the plan was. But I had I had that kind of uh, safety net in place, which it, it was invaluable to me because, you know, even though. I didn't have a job as such. I did have a nice bit of savings. So I sort of scaled things down a little bit. We weren't allowed to go out. We weren't going to pubs. We weren't, you know, meeting up with friends for dinners or things like that. So naturally, I was saving quite a bit of money month by month anyway in terms of my outgoings. But, um, you know, it, it was difficult because I was trying to change with, with my old company. I was trying to move remotely. But it just became too complicated. You know, they they were kind of new to it as well. They hadn't really branched into it as much. So for me, moving to TOT, I, I needed to find a company that had a strong framework with with what they're trying to do. They they needed to, for me, the company needed to have experience, and they needed to have people who who had the experience in in working remotely. You know, I think that TOT already had this. And that that then sort of pushing them forward kind of catapulted them above other people. And I, I could just see it as a standout. It just it just felt right. And I think that the team have been so, so great. Um, you know, teachers learning from each other. You know, we were kind of talking briefly earlier about sort of how I became the student. I think that so many of the teachers on TOT have have taught me so much through me observing their classes. Um you know, if, if they made a mistake, how did they get there and how could you dig yourself out of it? Or if they did something really, really good, wow, I'm going to steal that because nothing's copyrighted with teaching online if, if you're working as part of a team. I totally. believe that. So, like, if, if I see something that's really, really good, how can I utilize that? And I think that it goes into teacher hybridity, this idea that, you know, we, we can sort of just become frank. I remember Ash, TOT, he's, a, he's an experienced teacher. He, he said a couple of weeks ago about being a Frankenstein teacher. So just having all of these little bits of things and, and just being the best version of yourself. And totally. TOT was that platform, man. It really was. And uh, it, it's been absolutely great so far. I'm looking forward to teaching more. I'm glad you feel that way, man. I mean, I think yeah. when I, I'm just going to speak on behalf of the company a little bit. I mean, I think at the overseas teacher, we... We are a company that is extremely innovative within a very traditional sector. And by that, I mean the education sector hasn't really or never ha- or maybe never will change erratically. Mm. Um, but we are trying to create a ripple effect in such a traditional sector. We want it to be innovative. We want it to be, be creative. There once was a time where James would spend hours training people. But what we're seeing now is the more we grow... Like you said, going back to what you said, people are starting to train themselves. Yeah. So, so we're in this really nice, comfortable position now where we can just sort of sit back. Of course, we listen to what the clients are after. First Leap say there's a specific way that they want things to be, then we will inherit that and we will we will add that to to the to the bank. But a lot of what a lot of our success is coming from this sort of community feeling that's happening between mm. our teachers whereby everybody's bouncing ideas off of each other everybody's engaging um you know some people some people use this as a side job some people have other things in their life that they're they're concentrated on that's fine some people see this as something they want to maybe put into a career and go to china as well which is awesome and of course we encourage that Mm. but i think that i think that what makes tot special is that we are a group of mainly young individuals i mean you know you look at our director daniel yeah. He's an extremely young guy. He has, you know, really innovative, creative way of approaching approaching business. Um, and then you've got James, who's slightly more experienced, and he's been around the country 
uh, sorry, around the globe doing doing his thing, and he's got yeah. years of experience. And then we've obviously got people directly from China, like like Nate, who who has that experience of the culture and understands what it is the clients are after. Together, I think we just make a a really really nice, really really nice set of individuals. And mm. I think um, although we all work remotely, there is definitely a feeling of togetherness. I think which is really really important. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm glad. It makes me happy to know that you feel that way. It will mm. definitely make the rest of the management team happy to know you feel that way because that is exactly what we've been trying to pursue for for such a long time. Yeah, it's the core um, values. Totally, man. It's definitely our yeah. core values. Yeah. Um, I'm just going to finish off quick with with two quick questions. Sure. Um, first one I want to ask is, obviously, you spoke about how you, in your 10 days, break you had you went up north in china to to visit the what, what the warriors the, called again the terracotta warriors terracotta yeah. warriors i have heard of them they do look really cool they're the statues right they're all sure. next to, yeah they're yeah the army of super, stone yeah super badass but i wanted to know um what else in your spare time did you do in china yeah so i'm an avid writer so this is something that i definitely wanted to pursue in my free time and I think in terms of recreational activities, there isn't a whole lot in China because they are so work driven. You know, there aren't many societies or clubs that at least aren't English language related. So, you know, I talked briefly about Toastmasters, but I just like really like to, you know, take a taxi or, you know, take a road trip with some friends to the countryside and just look over the rice fields with, you know, pen and paper in hand. And I was able just to brainstorm things and, and really get an idea. I, I'm a script writer, so this is something that I wanted to pursue kind of after leaving drama school. I wanted to write plays. And I believe that I, I needed to find the right environment to really unlock that. So so that's something that I really loved doing was just traveling to different locations, sitting down, picnic and things like that, and just really doing some writing or, or some self-reflection or some you know, some journaling or anything like that. That's something that I really enjoy doing. And I think that now reflecting on that time at the time, it was kind of tedious, you know, not every day I wanted to write or I wasn't always in the mood to just look at creative things. But, you know, looking back now, sort of two years later, I'm thinking, wow, I'm I'm really glad I did that because, you know, I've got a brand new play. I've got travel right. journals and sort of looking at all of these fresh emotions and feelings as they were happening now you think wow you know i've i think i've come quite a long way since then and i think that that's a really exciting feeling yeah yeah i'm glad you was able to get so much out of it um mm. last last question is returning to china in the future a likelihood for yourself yeah that's a great question i think it definitely is um i don't think it's a forever option for me um but it's definitely something that I want to do again, just because of how much I took just from the one and a half years I was I was living out there. Um, I just I think as well that the big thing that people need to remember, and this is a big question as well that that props up all the time, is that making sure that you're traveling on the right visa, making sure you have your documents ready because things are getting more difficult now. Um, mm -hmm. I know a lot of teachers with TOT we've got embassy issues at the moment. That's what I like to call them, embassy issues. Um, it's it's just very, very difficult to get things notarized, to get things ready, to get documentation to go. I'm definitely going to wait until things calm down a little bit. Um, I hate using the phrase return to normal because I, I personally don't think it will. Um, but when things do get easier, travel restrictions get lessened, etc. I think it's definitely something I'm going to be thinking about. Um, you know, maybe traveling to a different part. And, you know, I really love China because I know it has the biggest ESL market. And I think that for me is the reason why I initially chose China. But for many people, China isn't for them. And that's OK. You know, there's places in Japan, Thailand, a lot of places in the East that offer ESL contracts, good jobs. And, um, you know, maybe the food is more to your taste or, or the culture is more to your taste. But for me, I, I absolutely loved the, the dining culture in China, you know, the round table, sharing all the dishes, having your beers out in the street, having barbecue food. And it, it just was a really, really special time. And I, I think that it's definitely something that I want to be doing again. Absolutely. And, 
you know, I'm hoping my family will come out and visit me. Uh, my mother and her friend visited me um, when I was there in 2019. And I could just see the the honeymoon phase that they went through being in China, just everything, you know, it was bright colors and noise and, and ambience. And, and they absolutely loved it. And, you know, they said sort of being over 40, both of them, they, they said, you know, I wouldn't want to live here. But I absolutely understand the the energy that comes off this place. And I just I love it. It's contagious. So, you know, I, th- I think for the younger individual going going to somewhere like China would be a really good option and definitely will be something I'm thinking of doing in the future. Yeah. Nice, man. Well, yeah. it's clear to see how much passion uh, is, in, is in your voice when you talk about it. And I'm glad you had such a great time. Love hopefully, it, yeah. hopefully we can keep you teaching online for a little bit longer. Um, <laughs> for sure, but, mate. I'll, I'll I'll be doing this for for some time. I think I, I'm I'm loving it. Good man. Well, look. Thank you very much, Fraser. I appreciate your time. Thanks everybody for watching. Uh, this has been the second episode of the Overseas Teacher Podcast. Plenty more lined up for the future, but today we've had a great podcast by Fraser. Thank you, mate. You're welcome. Thanks, everybody.